Welcome in a new episode of Air Learning Show, and I'm talking today with Rob Hatch. Uh, Rob Hatch is in Maine, I believe. Yes. Yeah. In that Maine. is that is um, uh, quite some time zones away from me. <laughs> so for you, it's in the morning. For me, it's already um, uh, afternoon. Um, but luckily, to Zoom, we can have these great conversations. So thank you for making your time available for this. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And um, I, there's a reason why, why I connected with you. Um, first of all, I saw the book to um, somebody that I knew. They tweeted about it. Uh, Chris Brogan is your partner in the business. And then yes. I, I saw the image of the book as well. And I saw the subtitle and it was about decision making. And I said, I need to learn. I need to read. The book. I need to learn about the book. And, and this is my topic. And then I understood also that you are also um, having a lot of contact with another of mine, Becky McRae. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Who's also mentioned. Becky and I have known each other for a long time. Yeah. yeah. And you talk about her in the book as well a couple of times. So I'll to um, bring that back later on. So um, first of all, Becky, thank you for making a connection as well as Chris. Um, you, how did you, how did you decide? Because writing a book is is not an easy thing, right? It's it takes a lot of time, and you need to, you know, um, you're not sure if it's going to be read by a, a, a number of people. Right. <laughs> so there's a lot of certainty there. So how did you decide to? to write the book, to go for this book? Uh, so this book kind of came, uh, came about after years of writing a newsletter. I've been writing a newsletter consistently for about nine or 10 years now. Every Thursday, it comes out uh, Thursday morning. And this is the topic that I write about a lot of times around decision making, around how to uh, put success in our way, how to set things up so that life is just a little bit easier because when we find ourselves in the moment, we're not very good at making decisions when, when, we're, when we're right in the moment and forced into a this or that. We don't always make decisions that are in our best interest or that are aligned with our goals and sometimes even aligned with our values. So we, we, get, we get caught. And this has just been a topic I've been writing about for a number of years, but finally decided that I wanted to pull all of those ideas together and put it out as a book. And Becky actually helped to shape it quite a bit. Um, one of the, she was one of the first people to, to actually read the, the drafts and, and gave me a ton of feedback uh, and really just sort of had been encouraging me to kind of put this together. And in this process, did you start by um, taking your newsletters and just mixing it up to create the book or did you start writing from scratch again? Uh, it was a combination. I mean, th there was definitely, there's definitely pieces of it that emerged from past writing where I felt like I had written about the topic in such a way that it was, it matched what I wanted to convey. And I reworked it and, and so I, it gave me something to go from, but then there's a lot of the, a lot of the content that is, you know, brand new as well. But having that writing for so many years and having talked about these topics, I started to piece together really the, the order in which I wanted to tell the story or, or, or lay out the book really. And, and the intention of it was, was really important. In fact, Becky's, you know, biggest and most guiding question for me in the beginning of this that she really pushed me to answer and focus on was what changes because I've written this book for the, what changes for the reader and what changes for me. And just honing in on that helped me to focus my energy on what's, what's the result I'm, I'm hoping for working backwards from there. I could talk about, you know, as I did, you know, in the beginning, there's, there's three sections of it, but the first section really articulating the problem that we're all facing and all of the various decisions that we're confronted with based on the amount of information and all, all the overload that we feel, uh, that I feel like we we were quite quite honestly not prepared to, um, you know, we we weren't wired for this basically, and then talking about some simple decisions, and then in the end really starting to to build some systems uh, that will serve us and and set up some uh, 
some systems in our lives that make decision making easier or just eliminate it altogether because the systems are working behind the scenes to support the type of life or type of business that we want. Mm -hmm. I'll, we'll talk about the book in a bit. Um, I first want to go back a little bit yeah. to you starting um, Owner Media Group, the company with Chris Brogan. H how did you get to that? Yeah. Chris and I actually uh, knew each other from grade school, honestly. And we reconnected around 2001. Uh, I think it was actually shortly after 9-11. Um, we, we reconnected, became friends again. And then it just in our separate careers been supporting one another, uh, just on, you know, having conversations, coaching each other long before he actually put out his book, Trust Agents. Uh, and then shortly after Trust Agents came out, he approached me about joining him and, and, and working with him. Like, you know, his business has started to grow and, or became actually a business beyond just his blog and his book. So we, we, talked and I actually said no at first. I, I loved the work that I was doing beforehand. I was running a nonprofit. Uh, I was serving children with special needs and their families and, and it was great rewarding work. It's what I had been doing for about 20 years, but I, I had to get to a point where I felt like I could offer something to him and to the people that we would ultimately be serving and really kind of anchor myself in, in that purpose basically and, and having a sense of, you know, how can I live this as a mission or, or, or do this work and feel, feel like it, it had a purpose. So we started that and we focused primarily on, you know, small business owners, on uh, solopreneurs, primarily consultants, coaches, people who really want to shape their own life and, and, and the type of work that they want to do. They're not interested in working in, uh, in corporate America necessarily, although we serve corporations as well at times, but, but people who, who are really trying to craft take their skills and craft a profession or a business on their own, you know, mostly service businesses, consultants, coaches, as I mentioned, you know, a lawyer who doesn't want to be part of a firm, an accountant who wants to help people and be on their own and have their own, own company. So that's the type of, of person that we found ourselves ultimately helping out and just primarily with how do you communicate who you are and what your business is about, you know, build a digital presence, but also how do you, um, manage yourself, you know, personal leadership skills and how do you manage your time? How do you focus your energy on the right things? How do you make better decisions? So those are kind of the areas that we tend to, to focus on most. And, and because I, me, Chris was the front man for the company. It was like the person that I knew that I was mm -hmm. visible, that was writing the blogs and having the book yeah. and doing these videos. So were you like more the guy in the office? Yeah, yeah. Uh, as Chris will, as Chris has jokingly said, you know, I'm uh, I'm the grown up. Uh, I'm the person who keeps things running behind the scenes, and uh, really the operations person. So for years and years, it, you know, my role has been um, building all of the the structures and systems that support uh, support the growth of our business. Uh, everything from all the email marketing that we do, all the sequences and 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 marketing campaigns and all the uh, promotions that we do, that's, that's, I'm building all of that behind the scenes. And the courses? Yeah. I mean, Chris, Chris does a lot, it does creates the content, but I'm, I'm piecing together the technical back end and, you know, taking care of all that. And, and was it uh, for a long time, was it just the two of you? Yeah. I mean, it still is. Uh, we, we've had people in and out. Um, we've had as many as I think four, uh, three or four other folks, you know, as, as direct employees, but had a number of uh, consultants or, or partners that we worked with at one time. And uh, we're, we're, it's right now, it's really just the two of us uh, from, you know, serving the, the owner media community. So. Cool. So, and now you are also becoming more visible. Um, the book is probably going to support you to do that as well. Um, <laughs> I, I see that, um, well, you've been in a couple of shows and podcasts. Is it time for you to move to the front? Well, you know, in my own in my own way, absolutely. I mean, the Chris and I, the business that we run together, Owner Media, really does focus on serving that community of you know, or that that uh, person who's a you know, solopreneur, entrepreneur, and providing webinars and and courses to do that. 
separately from from Chris and you know or he and I both have our own you know consulting businesses that we do separate separate from owner media so my personal uh, the thing that I most like to do is to coach owners and and people who are in a sort of a critical decision making role and a point in their business and I help guide them through that decision making process so my role I see is to sort of put someone in a position to make the best possible decision for their company and and whatever whatever that challenge is they're facing so I have clients who have been trying to start a business and I help them through that decision making process what do you need to know to make the best decision and we gather information or they gather the information, we talk it through, put them in a good position and then they make a decision and we go to the next stage of, of the business. Likewise, there are well-established you know, companies and uh, that, that are looking to scale or position themselves for acquisition or position themselves to acquire a smaller company. And again, it's a similar process, different, you know, uh, different type of company, but, but I'm working with the CEO to help them make the best decisions because there's so many options, right? So many ways to go. And I don't necessarily know exactly that path, but my job is to tease out what they're thinking about and tease out their expertise and help put those thoughts together into a clear and coherent process, evaluate the options and then move forward. And it just gives them the confidence each time when we get to that stage when they make the decision, they're not regretting it. They're not wondering if, you know, if they should have done something differently. They've made that decision because they know that they narrowed the options, looked at what was in front of them and made that decision and move forward. And what I, so that's primarily what I do. And it's, for me, it sounds so similar to what I do. So, so I have a lot of people that I coach on, this, on the topic. So that's, that sounds so similar. But also what I notice is, for example, when I have um, small business owners, is that they tend to have like a, a, a funnel where they're working in, right? So, so they are just focused on one option and they think that's mm. the only way to go forward and, and they don't see other options. So what I also sometimes do is just not just to help them to become clear on um, what be the best decision, but also to give them other ideas on the same topic so that they can make a better decision because they have more options because maybe the one they were just looking at was not the, the best one they were looking at. So, so I, do you see that too? Right. Yeah. I mean, less so to be honest with you, the, the, I, I, a lot of the clients that come to me, um, are often, there's just a lot going on. You know, they 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 feel like they should be doing this and more of this and more of that. And if I only could, and you know, I I know I should have done this. And so there's all this sort of regret mixed with I don't know which direction to go or where to focus. And and my job typically is to pull that together. That said, a lot of them do come to me with the, this one idea of what they think they're bringing as the challenge. But as we talk it's, that's not, that ends up not being the issue at all. Uh, and, and it, something else becomes abundantly clear that we've got to, you know, in terms of where we've got to focus our time and energy. I love that, you know, and I know it's going to happen. I can almost sense it in that first phone call when we're starting to talk. I'm like, okay, well, this is, this is good. And we'll, and I, we just let it happen. But the way my brain works, uh, you know, is I'm an associative thinker and, and I sort of, tie a lot of things together. So as they're talking, they might be, they might feel like they're blathering on and, and making no sense, but I'm, you know, I'm grabbing all these little cues and then somewhere in the call, I'll just thread them together and present it. And oftentimes it, you know, it brings clarity and focus for us to move forward. That's, and I love that process. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. Same here. In your book, you describe also how you, uh, because at some point in your book, you talk about um, chopping up these large goals into you know, clear actions, like somebody had a goal for, yeah. to have uh, 500,000 uh, revenue. How do you do this? How many calls do you need to make? Everything like that. And then you also talk about how you, what is your number? 
you talk about the number of calls that you have to make, um, not, not, not the number of forms that you get for, for these, um, these strategic calls. Um, so how do you drive people to your website, to that page, and how do you make sure that you get enough um, of these calls? How do you do that? Well, I rely mostly on my newsletter as my primary source of um, of marketing, promotion, and, and 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 you know selling. I sell you know basically through email marketing. That of course you know starts and Chris and I have talked about this a lot. There's you know so we see social media as kind of an outpost. This is where people are hanging out, and you get to talk to people on social media. Um, you know, you have interactions, you comment, you share things, you provide, a, you know, some sort of helping service. And eventually you want to be pulling people from those outposts to your website. When they come to the website, uh, there has to be a clarity a around why they came there. If they are, you know, getting people to the website is fine, but if they don't know why they're there, and if it's not clear what you want them to do, or how you're speaking to them or, or how you solve their problem, then it's almost pointless. The traffic is useless because they're just going to leave or, you know, so we often talk about narrowing the decisions that someone can make on the website. I mean, this is true in, uh, you know, on a sales page or a landing page, you don't want to give a whole people a whole lot of options. You want them to buy your webinar or whatever or your course or whatever your product is. So, when someone arrives at my website, and it may not be perfect, but the way that I've set it up is by having sort of declarative statement around who I am and what I do, basically, what I do. And then it's really clear, there's a big giant red button that says, you know, book your or book my free um, coaching call. Right there, that's that's pretty much all I want you to do when you're, <laughs> when, when you're there. Uh, so the way that that works, uh, event, you know, um, when I'm promoting to my newsletter that I have a call, you know, a number of slots open, or I might have a few coaching, coaching uh, opportunities available, then I'll, you know, I'm directly asking them and I'll send them, I'll even bypass my website. I'll just take them right to the scheduling page because that's where I want them to go. So it's a process of pulling people in. If I, you know, if I want them to join the newsletter, then I've got to ask them to join the newsletter right away. I can't have join the newsletter, book a coaching call, buy my book, buy this. That's not the point. You know, I, that's too many options. I want to narrow the focus and say, I want you to do this thing right now. I, so there are times when I'm not asking for the sale of a book or a course or even coaching, just asking you to sign up for the newsletter if this content I've shared with you is useful and helpful to you. Uh, it, it, you know, I want to keep it really simple. Every single ask, I want to keep really simple. So then when they join the newsletter, they get a nice welcome sequence that explains who we are, what we do, what to expect. And then I just write newsletters. And, and then every so often I ask them to do something else. We've got a webinar. Would you like to join? Uh, so it's, it's a really, I try to keep things really crisp and clear in that regard. Uh, to, to get people to that point. And then the thing that you're mentioning in the, in, in the book around one number, I know that I don't want to focus on selling coaching. What I want to focus on is the thing that most likely influences or increases the likelihood of someone actually signing up. That happens to be that phone call. So the more qualified people that I can speak with on a phone call, the likelihood of coaching clients goes up. So everything then is directed towards when I'm asking for that, everything would be directed towards how do I get someone just to get on the phone and sign up for a call? Uh, and and that it's, it, I try to keep it that clear because hmm. that's what I want. Uh, I, I just want to go back to this part with the, where, you, where you decided to go um, work together with Chris because I you said, uh, I said no because you had this great um, focus and mission in life and um, yes. this nonprofit that you're looking for. But um, how long did it take you to to make the, the decision that really was it for you? 
it was a few days, it was several days actually. I, I really, uh, you know, he offered something and I needed to think about, I mean, it was a pretty big shift um, it, it, or it felt like a bigger shift at the time because I wouldn't be working with children and families and, and interacting with, with people that I've been serving for so many years. And in a, you know, previous to that, in that career, I had advanced to a point in another, in a childcare company before I ran the nonprofit that I got, that got me so far removed for children and families. You know, the job paid really well. I had lots of responsibility. I was overseeing, you know, 35 different childcare centers up and down the East Coast in the United States. And it was, you know, a great position, but it was so far removed from the, the mission of, or the work itself that it was not very fulfilling. So that was a real big factor for me in the decision-making. How do I make this move and still feel connected to helping people or, and part of what has evolved is, is this idea that I've been coaching people my entire career. When I was working with teachers uh, and leading, you know, the nonprofit, we had classrooms for tr these children. My job was never really the person, I was never the person who took care of the children directly. I, so, you know, identified and supported the people who did. I found great people and I helped coach them to be the best version of themselves in service to that mission. And that, that's sort of part of that decision-making process or being able to say, can I in this way support Chris to do his best work, support the other people that we're, we're working with to do their best work. And so that part of the mission it didn't, you know, wasn't always about the, the children for me. It was really about how do I support someone to do their best work? That helped a lot. And is that a very analytical process for you when you're making this decision? Or is it just ruminate and then... I'd like to think it was, but it wasn't. <laughs> it's very emotional, honestly. Right, right. Really, you know, I, I, you know, I think we all like to think we have this very analytical process, but in the end, I've always been much better served by making decisions that are rooted in, I mean, you know, there's an analytical part of this, you know, either factors that you can consider, but in the end, I had to feel it. Like, you know, all the information on that prior career that I mentioned, that opportunity where I was running all those childcare centers, the, you know, analytically, it, the money was there, the career advancement was there, the status was there, the, the freedom, you know, to, um, you know, to set my days and, and, and it was, there's so many benefits to it, but the emotional connection wasn't there. The part of it, I didn't factor that in enough at that point. I was looking more at the externals and this time I really made sure that I was focusing on, am I going to enjoy this every single day doing this work and working with Chris and supporting others? And uh, that was, that was it. And I knew everything else would be fine. Right. And, and I asked, I, I, like you said, I have a feeling that I'm very analytical about decision making. And it, it shows in, in the way that I do things, I, the processes they use and the way I work, it's all very organized. Like, like you described in your book, how you make the better decisions, how you set up your day. If we talk about that on the next topic, talk about how you, how you came, how you came to this. It all sounds very structural, organized, um, stuck and uh, boxed and, and, and I mean that in a good way. I mean that it's, for me, that's yeah. the way it works the best, right? So, so um, let's get that because let's, you may want to explain about this part uh, in your holiday, how you came to this whole process. Yeah, so the, the idea of structure is something I eschewed for years because my brain was everywhere. I'm, I, 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 as an adult, I was diagnosed with ADHD. So I never liked structure, hated structure. So I was always keen on, my brain always likes to be working on something. And the problem with that, you know, not liking structure is that you end up almost recreating things over and over and over again, because you, know how to do it. You know, uh, a simple example that I, you know, I, I, I often talk about is this, this idea that when I mentioned before, I do 
all the setup for the webinars, all the back end stuff. I can do that from memory, kind of. And my brain kind of likes doing it from memory in the sense that it's something to work on. It gives it something to, to do and it, but it doesn't, it's not a creative process anymore. The creativity part is done. That's the content, but setting up all of the pieces doesn't need to be a creative exercise. It doesn't need to be an exercise in which I make a lot of decisions because the outcome is really clear and the setup is really clear. So I used to, try and remember it all. And I'd say step one, step two, step seven, oh crap, step three, no, step five, and I'm back and forth and back and forth. And I'd get it all done, but I might miss one and maybe there'd be a consequence or maybe I'd get it all right, whatever. But I'd spend all this time, but I finally figured out that what my brain really likes is to, to work on, I'd rather move that creative energy to something that is actually creative, that I enjoy doing rather than wasting all that decision-making energy and creativity on that process. So I set up a system, I, you know, we, I call it action stacks and really it's just a simple checklist for a repeating process that I go through every single time I pull it up, I go through the steps. I don't have to think about it because I don't want to waste energy. And I, you were mentioning earlier, the idea of, uh, or what happened on that vacation, for me was starting to realize that when I decided ahead of time, so to me that action stack is a preset decision. When a webinar is coming, this is what you do. No need to make a decision. It's all here. Just follow along. Already done. The same thing was true on my vacation. I found myself and, you know, at the time I was taking work on vacation more. Now, at that, you know, I really try to separate that. But I was taking work with me, as many of us do. And, but I'd set some real limits because I, I like to spend time with my family and I didn't want to impede on that at all. And I would, the night before I said, I'm just going to work on three things and I'm only going to work for a few hours. And I set some rules for myself. Just don't check email because you'll get sucked in and don't check social media because you're going to waste time. So I got up early, two hours, three projects, very clear what I wanted to work on. And I didn't have any of those external interruptions, didn't allow them and found myself later on turning to my wife at the beach going, I got more done in those two hours than I have in entire days and sometimes multiple days in an office where I was interrupted all the time. And that began the process of examining and looking at the research for why did that happen? Um, why does it, why do our brains you know, like that, or why did, why was that a more productive time? What, what were the functions of that process and really ended up with a whole new way of operating for me because before I would allow all the interruptions, I thought having the open door policy as a manager was great and I'll oh, come in anytime, you know, whatever you need. And that I was always split focused and, and never getting my work done. And I try to cram it in and I leave and I feel it unfulfilled and I wasn't doing the right things and I felt scattered. And then I was also not spending much time with my family because I'd have to stay late to get my stuff done. By flipping that, deciding the night before, and this is what I do now, is at the end of my day, I have a slot of time where I stop and I look at tomorrow and I say, okay, what are the three most important things for me to work on? That I put in my, I put that in my, the two hours I call my success block. Because if I at least get that done, the rest of the day blows up, then I know I've had a productive day. I, I defined success by those three most important projects. I still do more work, but that it's, that's the focus, the primary focus. I have to get really specific. That's really important it is I don't just put make 10 calls if it's phone calls I need to make or sales calls or, you know, which isn't necessarily part of my job all the time. But just as an example, I would never just put make 10 calls or update website is not something that is helpful. What is helpful is to put something really specific and say, write two paragraphs for your about page, um, you know, on your website, that level of specificity really sets me up to, I don't have to make the decision. I don't wonder what update website means. I don't have to scan my website and say, where do I start? I've decided ahead of time. I've set the time aside 
two hours. It's usually eight to 10 in the morning. I, w I walk in, I know exactly what I'm supposed to be working on. I have everything laid out, all the decisions were made and I just get to start working. So it makes it, it makes it a lot easier. And that really emerged from honestly that those days before, you know, getting up and going to the beach with my family on vacation, just figuring that out for myself that my brain would benefit from structure. So to go back to what you're saying around the sort of really uh, structured process, it one, it doesn't come naturally to me. It's something that I resisted for years and years and finally understood that I benefit from it. And, and this idea of deciding ahead of time just saves so much time and energy. And I get to do so much more of what I want to do, whether that's work or whether that's be with my family, because I've, I'm structuring my day that way and helping my other tendencies of, 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 of being distracted and, and everything else. I have a little system set up to help me manage that and, and use my energy where I want it. I think I've, I started reading your book two weeks ago. I'm not sure, but somewhere around that time. And um, mm -hmm. when it was on a um, promotion at uh, Amazon for the launch. And um, after reading for a couple of days, I, I thought, so I have to start implementing this system because um, it will help me to have a better conversation with you, one. And two, I thought, oh, this might work for me too. Because what I did, I, I'm doing this already for a long time, is there's number three, it's also, it's, it's very, um, uh, it's a number that's really important to me. So I, I have like, three goals every month, every quarter, every day, every, so all the time, so I start with a year, then it goes to the quarter, and then goes to the month, and then goes to the day, uh, the week, and then to the day, and that's yeah. been a system for me for a long time. So I have three projects um, that are important for me today that I need to work on, only three. So I don't have a complete to-do list with all these options on because then I won't get any work done. I have just three, right. and once these three are finished, I'm really happy, so I could stop working, I don't often do, but I could stop working, <laughs> but it, I'm happy, right? So the day is fine. And this is already a concept for a lot of people that is really um, frustrating, but also um, relieving because once they start working with it and I help them process yeah. it, they, 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 they realize that they get work done. And right now they have maybe a, a, a to-do list, which is really long. And they say, you know, if I only do that, I can get all these other stuff done. But right now they weren't doing that anyway, so it, right. it just changes. They get the three most important one done. That's that's important. So I did this, but what happened, especially I think when um, uh, Corona started, is I tend to just use all day for these three things. So these projects were just a little bit bigger, and I tend to use stretch it throughout the day, and using a lot of um, yeah. uh, distractions like you described in the book, um, mm -hmm. you know, get in this funnel of answering some emails and spending an hour on Twitter and uh, maybe half an hour on LinkedIn. And then, oh yeah, I have to get back to my project. And then I thought, so what if I change this system and use it like you said, just crunch it to two hours and put the time behind it, right? So uh, have a set time when you do this. So not just um, saying I started 10, but it takes this t task takes 30 minutes or 40 minutes. That's it. More, not, not much more. That's yeah. it. Three of these most important projects, like you said, um, not update the website, but write the um, two paragraphs of the new books. And it works like magic. It really works like magic. Whenever yeah. I don't get the thing done, which I wrote down, I was probably sometimes too optimistic how much time it's going to take me. I wrote down 30 minutes and it took me longer. I just stop at 30 minutes and I just reschedule a new task um, for the next day or the day after. Yeah. It depends. And also the other thing, which I wrote a post about this morning, is about the blank sheet next to my <laughs> work. So yeah. tell me something about that. Because it's difficult. Yeah, that's, that's honestly my favorite uh, tool is 
having, you know, it started as, as just having a, a blank piece of paper next to me. And, and this is managing the distractions of my head. My, sometimes it's notifications that distract us, which, you know, just as a little side note, pitch, whatever, the first thing anyone should be doing is turning off all the notifications on every device as off, you know, as many as you can. Um, and this agree, varies for agree, agree. You know, different businesses, but that's a, that's the first step. So turning off those external distractions is a really big thing, but my brain will distract me as much as those notifications. It loves to think of things that you have, I haven't done or things I need to do. And, oh my gosh, I've got to right. I forgot. I've got to do this. And I'll start that because I'll say, ah, oh, this will just take me a minute. Let me do it right now before I forget, which I think is one of the most dangerous, dangerous sentences that we've, uh, that we have, that we use. It's like, oh, it's just take me a minute. Let me do it before I forget. Because we'll start, we'll make that quick phone call. And on the way back from the phone call, we'll say, well, let me just check my email. And then you're looking at your email and a million tiny decisions. And, oh, I've got to respond to this. Before you know it, you are several steps away from the thing that you were working on and you don't know where you left off. You've lost your focus. You've lost your creativity, all of the energy that you were using. So the blank page helps me because the minute the thought comes into my head, I just jot it down on the blank page to capture it safely because I know I will forget. I was right, but I don't need to go do it right now. Rarely do we need to absolutely stop what we're doing and do it. Capture it, get back to work as quickly as possible. And just that simple process of write it down, get back to work, write it down, get back to work. You can return to that focus work so much faster and you don't get so far away from it that you forget where you were. Just a simple note. And I have a couple of times throughout the day where I might check that list and I might you know, put it in its proper place, but definitely at the end of the day, reviewing all those little things uh, that I had on there. Most of the time I can wait till I'm on lunch. You know, if I'm taking a lunch break in the middle of the day, I can probably make that phone call that I thought I needed to interrupt the most important work of my day with, uh, you know, doctor's appointment or whatever it is. So it, it, it usually it can wait. And that's my favorite tool because it just tames my brain again, uh, gives it a safe place. I write it down, I get back to work. And now I've integrated it with, I have a daily sheet that I write out the night before where I plan my day. I write everything out by hand, which is another decision-making process for me. When I am faced every day with the things that I have to work on, um, maybe there's that list or a list, you know, a lot of people still have a to-do list and that's fine. So you've got these things. When you are, when you rewrite that sheet every day and you rewrite those things on the list that you need to do, you're, and you're giving, you've set a time to review that and rewrite it it's like you're, you're giving yourself an opportunity to reconsider the priority of even having that thing on the list to begin with. Most of the time, the thing that started on the list that I keep either putting off really wasn't that important. I thought it was in the moment, so I, it made the list. But in review, it ended up not sticking around. And that, so when you write something out five times in a row each day, every day, you start to think, is this do I really need to do this or can this be, or does it need to look like something different or, you know, um, so it, to me, that's also, a, it's like a priority review for why am I even keeping this around uh, or why am I putting it off so often? If I keep it down low on the list, now is the time it needs to be bumped up. Um, so I love that process for that reason as well, because it sort of forces me every day to confront what I thought was important yesterday or Two, two weeks ago, just may not be a priority right now. Smart. I, I use Notion um, and on a daily calendar to add my, um, and actually I have my morning ritual for, then I have the block of two hours, then I have the rest of the day, which is usually then calls or meetings or whatever, because I've learned mm -hmm. also, uh, I, think, I think it was on the book, um, no, I forgot what the book was. It's about your your um, uh, your rhythm that you naturally have. Are you an early bird or an average person or are you a, a night owl? And I'm an early bird. Um, mm -hmm. So for me, it's really smart to do these things in the morning and then have these calls like podcast recording or just have meetings with people in the afternoon because then my brain doesn't need so much energy anymore. 
Um, yep. I think I'm struggling with that, so I have two questions for, for this for you. Um, when you create the list for the three actions, the three goals that you want to accomplish in the dial block, which I, I'm calling our focus block, <laughs> and mm -hmm. um, do you determine the order also at the evening? And the second question is, um, when you switch from one task, from action to the next one, do you have like a mini book or like how do you reset your mind? Uh, great questions. Yeah, I I do set the order. I mean, I have like it, it written out. Uh, and the yeah, so I'm I'm thinking about what's the you know eight o'clock in the morning. I'm kind of also checking my energy if it's you know early in the morning. Am I is that, that something that I'm really going to be able to to dive into and 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 so I'm there's a, a couple of little you know probably very emotional decisions that that go into that. But it helps me to kind of get a sense of all right, what needs to be done here. Again, it's only forty minutes. I, you know, it's a, for me, it's always a two-hour block of time, forty minutes for each task, which leaves a little time in between. And that time in between is really helpful for me in my brain. Uh, the way I work, I I need to stand up and move and and get apart from what I was just working on. So that for me is the break. Whether that's get a coffee, get a you know go grab a glass of water, check in with my daughter who's, you know, doing remote schooling right now. It's something like that. I use that moment to step away. You know, I've done that one task, it's all complete. And now I need to, I need to move, you know, just give my brain a reset basically. And then I can come back. But when I come back, the great thing is I don't have to go. So where was I? I, the next task is clearly defined. And that's to me also the beauty is I know when I'm coming back that I don't have to make a decision. It's done. You know, I did that last night. It's right there. It's pretty clear. I'm going to sit down for another 40 minutes and, and do that. 40 minutes is about as long as I can go. A lot of people work in 20 minute chunks. I do that for other tasks throughout the day. Try not to expect my brain to be focused for much more than that 40 minutes. How do you avoid in those short breaks that you don't get distracted? Because I have an issue with that right now. So I, that's my next phase I need to go up to. Well, in, you know, if we're, if we're being, you, we were talking earlier about, you know, the difference in, in COVID for you and how the, the projects would stretch out through the day. So I, I think we have to also account for, you know, stuff happens and, you, you know, we have to give ourselves a break. We, we can't be so, sometimes being regimented just doesn't fit with our daily life. Most of the time, when I get up to go take a break, I know what I'm doing. I'm going, you know, I'm, I'm going to go get a cup of coffee. And I'm going to come back. I might check in with my daughter, but in that process of checking in with her, because I, I want to make sure everything that she's all set, that's the new sort of COVID reality. I didn't have that before. So I'm not going to be mad at myself if that takes 10 minutes or 15 minutes. I'm not going to be mad at her if she needs me because this this needs to be done and and so i leave myself i give myself a little bit of a break in there you know um i don't want to feel guilty about oh i get in rushing back and making her feel like crap i set this up honestly for her in some ways because i want to be able to spend more time with her so she needs me in that moment in that break time now when i'm focused i do have some rules with my family i have rules with my wife you know around interrupting around you know, they know that I'm working. Obviously, if there's something that rises to the level that they really need me, then they should be able to break through. But they also know, you know, dad's focused or my husband's focused right now. My wife could call me. One of the rules we have is she could call me and I'm going to ignore that phone call. If she calls me twice, that's the signal that says, hey, this is more important than whatever you've decided. And this is our signal as a family, our decision as a family. You've received two calls from me. I need you now. Stop what you're doing. Uh, and having some rules like that helps me to stay focused as well. So what helps me going away and taking a break is just knowing that the break is, uh, you know, to go get coffee. It's not to check Facebook. That's not the break that I'm looking for because it's also not to check my email. That two hour block of time, one of the rules is no social media. The other rule is no email. So I'm not going to, take that one minute and just make sure everything's okay. 
that, that will send me way off. Yeah, I know not. The reality of my daughter, you know, being here, I'm fine with that. But again, but, but you, anything that's really can pull you in that you're susceptible to, you got to set some pretty firm rules around and just avoid, you know, you can't, it doesn't work when you say, well, I'm just going to take a couple minutes and relax and I'm just going to scroll through TikTok or whatever. <laughs> it's not, it's not going to be a few minutes. You're going to be gone for 20 and you know, it's, it's not helpful. Uh, right. So my rules are pretty firm around that. I have to get more firm on those rules then. Cause I'm, I check, um, Twitter and LinkedIn usually in those couple of minutes and I, I don't watch the timeline. I just watch the replies to me. So that's, um, so I keep it short, but still I tend to, um, slip away sometimes. And uh, I don't have any problem with, uh, you know, with, with social media or, 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 you know, checking those things. The question is when and for what purpose, you right? Know, no, and I, so I, I do check, you no, know, I, I check, I, I check. Agree, Facebook I agree. So, so I just, I just, yeah. I just, I'm asking these questions. So I, I just need to, um, have better rules and be more strict in those two hours. That's what I, it's going to end up to. Yeah. Yeah. It's that two hour block is pretty sacred. Again, the only wiggle room I've been giving myself in, during COVID is I got a, you know, I, I've got a 10 year old that, that might need me to break, you know, break focus a little bit just to help her. And that's okay. Right. Okay. I have, I have a couple questions. One is, um, ritual versus process. I didn't get that part. Yeah. So we have, um, it's like, uh, the routines of something are one thing, but when we ritualize something, it, it, it get, it has more meaning. I think, a I think of a ritual as something that kind of anchors us into a meaning and whereas a process is something that's just a, you know a routine or, or a, a system that we work through the, the action stacks in general are just a routine that we want to go through we don't have to think about it much whereas a ritual is something I, I think about where you want to have you're trying to set your mind on something or you're trying to focus your intention a little differently so to, to, to make a ritual out of something, I think it just has a little bit more intention, a little bit more meaning. And, and for me can help me. Um, I, I, we were talking about this before in terms of that decision-making it, you know, the emotional part of decision-making is thinking about what does this mean to me? What is, so if there's a ritual that helps you to calm your mind and focus your, your, you know, your energy on the, on, on something meaningful to you, uh, if there's a way to kind of repeat that and ritualize it, I think, you know, that's where I would lean on rituals different from the routine of I have every week, I have to set this thing up in a certain way. And I don't really need to think about it. It's just routine for me. And, and I re can repeat it. Does that, does that clarify things a little bit? Does it mean that, or was there a context that you No, I'm, I'm just, I'm just seeing if I can understand it. Does it mean that if we have a ritual, it, it's easier to maintain than routine for in the long run, I mean, Hmm. I don't know. I think of them, um, a little bit differently, but I'm, uh, but you know, I, I'm trying to remember specifically what, what, because, we're, because we're, rituals, what I, I uh, talked about in the book, but rituals are also, um, things to in a certain order. It's, it's steps you need to do. Oh, yes. Yeah, there are definitely steps that you need to take and, 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 you know, a ritual is repetitive, but I think there's a different purpose for a ritual than, a, than a routine. Um, okay. That's, that's, know, that's, that's, I think it was more solemn. You were, um, you were preparing for the, the triathlon mm -hmm. and, um, you put your running gear, your running shoes bad. So that you know, the next morning you will start with the running. What in this part is a ritual? So in that case, the part of that that's a ritual is, is I'm, I'm really trying to connect with why I'm doing this work in the first place that, you know, so for me, for training, um, it, there was, it was all kind of rooted in just wanting to be a healthier person, 
but but beyond that the meaning of all of that was i want to be around for a long time for my kids i want to be healthy and so when i go through that process and kind of ritualize the preparation it really helps me to get through it a lot easier because there's a meaning associated there's a purpose rather than just mindlessly setting things out you know I, I can really anchor myself in in especially if i'm struggling right you know the night before i don't always want to get all the gear together there's there's something uh you know i know that it's right for me uh and this is deciding ahead of time and and we're talking about the, that concept of put success in your way the night before if i'm going to go out and ride my bike or go for a run i like having everything in front of me and I need to, it makes it a lot easier to get out the door, which is the hardest part. So there are times when I don't always feel up to that. But when I anchor myself in the, in the why, or not, you know, why I'm doing it, the meaning of it, remember you're doing this for your kids. Remember you're doing this to be healthy. Remember you're doing this because you're trying to change the way you live and, and, and your you know, entire family history, whatever. All of those things had meaning and it, ritualizing it gave me just that much more um, energy to, to set up the things that I needed to do. The same is true as, with something as simple and there's some great, uh, there's some great studies that were done, I'm trying to remember, um, but that on people who were able to picture themselves, you know, see a, like a version of themselves aged in retirement as either happy or sad and really visualize the the you know, and feel that sort of empathy and that emotional connection with if i didn't save for retirement this is what i would look like or if i did save for retirement this is what i would look like and having an emotional connection with fu your future self happy or sad actually increased and may, uh, helped people make better decisions about money that they were given so ha that's to me having that emotional connection. That's where emotional decisions are really important. And a ritual I think of is a, is really anchoring yourself in the emotional part of the routine. Right. So so there wasn't a goal at some point saying maybe there was at one point, but saying I I want to finish a triathlon. Like many people have this goal that's saying I want to finish a marathon. No, the goal is I want to be healthy. I want to be there when my kids are growing older to live longer. Um, so that's, mm -hmm. uh, that is a, a goal that's easier to maintain than just this goal, which is once you've finished the, the triathlon or the marathon or whatever, because then you're done. And the next, yeah. you see people that are, did this, that are also struggling and getting back into um, training or whatever, f because the, the goal is completed. There's no reason to go. The yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I've definitely felt that like after triathlon training, you know, I, I, I fell out of rhythm a little bit with that too, and had to revisit the idea of, um, you know, why I did it in the first place, because it was, it was both. I mean, I liked, I liked the idea of accomplishing something like that. There's, there's a part of me that loves the, oh, I, I did this thing that not a lot of people do. Um, this, I think the same is true, you know, with a book for crying, you know, like this is, there's an accomplishment there. But you have to kind of return to that or if, if with Becky's guidance in the beginning, why were you doing this first place? What, what changes after it's done? What, you know, what changes for other people? What changes for you? And by focusing on that change and, and the result that you're really ultimately after, not just the accomplishment of the goal, that to me is a bigger motivator of, of consistency and drive than, than just the one goal, uh, you know, I, I, we talked about the, your day is your week is your month is your year stuff and breaking the goal down from a revenue goal. I think that's really helpful to get going and to think about, all right, this year I want to generate this much money. But I also, and I, you know, kind of talk about this and this idea of small, big, small is what's the bigger goal that you're after? Like, what is that money going to do for you? What type of lifestyle? What are you trying to create overall and having a more, holistic look at what the purpose of that is really helps to set focus. So you can still have goals like a marathon or uh, 
goals, you know, financial goals, but I love to keep an eye on what am I doing this all for to begin with? Yeah. It's just more powerful for me. Yeah. And, and helps with decision making all the time as well. You know, in the moment decision making, if, it, if I can remember, you know, why I don't need that thing that just popped up on Amazon to tell me it's on sale, even though it's really appealing, why I don't need a third guitar or a fourth guitar, because the two I have are really, you know, just fine. Uh, even though that one looks shiny and pretty and might be fun to play with, I don't need it, you know? Yeah. I it's helpful. I agree. Um, you have this magical question. Um, what does it look like that you ask a lot? That's, uh, that, that was a amazing thing that they learned also from the book is, is, is if you have somebody saying this and just asking this, what does it look like? Cause it gives you so much context and ideas and, um, pictures of, than just saying something, right? Somebody saying, okay, I, I want $150,000 in a year. Okay, what does it look like for you? That, that, com that paints a completely different picture because 105 is just it's a number, but usually they have a, a reason why they want this number, why they came to this number, because they want to take care of their kids. They want to take care of the house, whatever the reason is. But by asking this question, I, I, so I, I really love that question. So that was for me, it was a really insightful question. Um, Thank you. To, to close it off, I, I want to ask you um, the question that Becky asked you. So, so what is it you want to change for the people that read the book? Well, I, you know, I'll give credit to Becky. I think it's a great question. So thanks for asking it again. My one of, one of the biggest, in, you know, intentions I had with all of my writing and, and particularly with writing the book is to help people reclaim just a little bit more control of their time and, and, and their attention and where they're placing it. Because we've, I think it's always been a struggle for us, to be honest with you, like a, a, a culturally, it, you know, we get caught up in a whole lot of pursuits that, that, you know, take over and we end up reacting instead of taking a moment to pause and decide and act with intention. And I think this is even more true right now with the amount of information that we're faced with and, and the number of distractions and, tech, and the way that technology is set up to, to grab our attention. So what I most hoped would, people would walk away with is understanding some simple ways that work for them because all of this is the, the methods that I share are meant to be flexible. What put success looks like for you, you know, put, put success in your way looks like for you is going to be different than what it looks like for me. So, but the concept is, is, you know, something that is easy to understand and then take simple steps, make simple decisions to get yourself a little further along. You know, how do I make it that much easier for me? So that's really, in the end, I wanted people to re reclaim some of that time and, and that space from between reacting you know, seeing something and reacting to it and, and, and take some control back. Yeah. I, um, I love two lines of that. One is in the end of the book, it says, use the power of simple decisions to reclaim your and attention. And the other one is in the beginning, I just have to scroll back. Where are you? Between stimulus and response, there is a space. That space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. Yeah, it's a great quote, um, and it's it's not mine, uh, misattributed often to uh, uh, Viktor Frankl, but we can't quite figure out the source of it. But it was it, 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 it's it's a really great quote, and I think really apt for this time. That stimulus and response, stimulus and response. That's the that is exactly describes the world that we live in right now with the little red dot notification, the buzz, the ding, the pop-ups, the banners, whatever's coming up around us. Um, but of course, it's not just technology. As I was talking about before, it's my brain, you know, that, that interrupts me and thinks, oh, I need this, I need this. Or if you're a manager, the interruptions of, uh, you know, of someone walking in all the time, it's okay to close your door. It's okay to say, you know, I'm going to focus on this because this is what's important and you're important too. 
So for me to split my decision, my time between you is, is going to leave me less focused on you and less focused on my work. Let's set some time to focus on you. So that stimulus response is breaking free of that, creating just a bit of space in between there. Yeah. So um, first of all, I, I will do this for you. Um, you should buy the book as a listener. You can buy it on Amazon. Um, you can buy, if you're in the Netherlands, you can just buy on Kindle, the digital version, which is very easy. I read it on Kindle. I made all these um, notes and highlights. And so I have uh, like 20 pages of highlights now. Um, so, so just buy the book. Thank you. And the second thing is now up to you because then you have the option to say, where should people go to find you and what action do, they wanna, do you want them to take? Sure, you can, uh, you can always uh, come to robhatch.com uh, where you can easily sign up for R -O -B a newsletter. H -A -T -S yes, H-A-T-C-H. Dot com. Yeah, R-O-B-H-A-T-C-H dot com. And, and there, you, you know, there's a couple of options. So the thing that I most want people to do when they come there, obviously, is to sign up for the coaching. At the same time, I recognize that people are coming there for the first time. So if you, you know, you can always sign up for my weekly newsletter that comes out every Thursday and, and just kind of come along for the ride, see if it's for you and see if the message, you know, if, if, if what I'm writing about resonates, then, then great. Uh, we'd love to, you know, love to have an exchange. And Thursdays is another favorite time for me after the newsletter comes out is getting responses from people and having, you know, having some time set aside to reply to, to emails is one of my favorite times as well. So you're going to hear from me if you were, if you hit reply, uh, you're going to get you're going to get something back. Rob, thank you very much for um, explaining, uh, answering my questions to get an even more better understanding of why what happened, what, what your decisions were. It was great thing to you. Well, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. It was it was wonderful, wonderful talking with you, and I appreciate all the questions.